helping our leaders to uh, that you are guiding uh, their step and their hand. Father, I just pray for tonight. I just ask for uh, to be a help, be a blessing as we sit down and open up the scriptures and um, and study your word. In Jesus name. Amen. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever used the word excruciating? Have you ever used the word excruciating? And honestly, I think we use it sometimes to make people sympathetic or empathetic to the pain that we were experiencing. Uh, it's interesting where this word comes from, and it's not really that old, but um, excruciating is actually a Latin word from, it actually comes from excruciare or excruciare. And if you were to break that word down, it comes from the word crucify or crucifixion. This word was not even in existence until the crucifixion or after the death of Jesus Christ. You know, you think about excruciating, trying to describe your pain. Uh, we've had several people that had um, heart attacks and they talked about how excruciating it was or it felt like an elephant was sitting on their chest. Uh, if you've ever had a gallbladder attack, you would say that was excruciating. For those who have had uh, kidney stones, you, you know, you're in the floor and you're saying this was excruciating. Well, the word excruciating coming from the word crucifixion, and you, I started thinking, you know, I don't know if I could exactly use the word excruciating if, the, if it implies what the crucifixion was all about. I mean, I can define it. I, I will. I mean, we don't, I think we know what it is. It's unbearable pain or somebody who is in extreme agony. So not until Jesus Christ's crucifixion that we get the word excruciating. You know, the cross is defined as excruciating, something that was a torture device. It, it's been an interesting study in, in looking at the crucifixion. It's been an interesting study looking at the history of the cross and what that entails. There's a lot of false information, obviously, out there, but the the cross is not new to Christianity, or it wasn't just to Christianity. Um, in fact, it dates back even to the Egyptian times. But I'll talk about that later. But the Persians were the one who actually came up it seems like 300 BC with crucifixion or using the cross to crucify. However, the Romans really perfected it. And when they perfected it, they did a great job. And they started using uh, the cross and crucifixion a hundred years before Christ uh, was born. Now, as you think about it, what does the cross look like? Well, the Apostles' Creed, Henry uh, Crock writes this. He said, before the time of Christ, the cross was a symbol of shame, ignorance, dishonor. Like the guillotine, the noose, the electric chair, it was an instrument for execution of the worst criminals. In fact, he says the cross was branded upon the forehead of criminals as a symbol of disgrace before the entire world. Now, there is nothing good about the, the, the purpose of the cross as far as what it was designed for. And when they perfected it, they perfected it to be absolutely dishonoring and shameful and disgraceful, a place of extreme pain. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, the, the Bible actually talks about the shame of the cross. It talks about what the cross was Hebrews chapter 12, verse two says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the father, the throne of God. Now here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse two describes the, describes the cross of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion in two ways. It says he endured the cross and then he says he despised the shame. Now, I want us to look at what shame could there possibly be with the cross? Well, the Romans wanted to mortify these criminals. They didn't take them and put them on a cross behind a jail somewhere. They didn't take them to a remote area and put the criminals on the cross. They were there to be put as an example. They not only 
that after beating them, they stripped their clothes completely off. And we're going to talk about what it meant to, for them to carry the cross, what that looked like uh, according to Roman history. But they were carrying their cross through the streets, completely naked, going to their stipe or going to their post. What a, what a shameful thing this is. And in fact, one Roman ruler was attacked. And to make an example, he actually had um, 2,000 crosses at one time. And he hung these people on there. Could you imagine the women, the children, boys and girls, grandparents walking past all of these bodies? In fact, it's been said that it is believed during the Roman period that the Romans actually crucified over 30,000 people. Can you imagine 30,000 deaths to crucifixion? They really, really got good at what they did and they perfected it. That has been proven over and over but they wanted to publicly humiliate these people. How much more shameful or humiliating can it be to be before people unclothed, thousands of people carrying your, your cross through the, through the street? But honestly, I've thought about it. After you're in so much pain, would the shame even matter anymore? I mean, is there, do you reach a point where you don't care? Because when he says not only the shame, but enduring the cross, what was the endurance like for the cross? What did it mean to endure the cross? Well, as you know, you have listened to people preach on it. You've, you've, you've probably watched videos. You've probably seen history of the Roman crucifixion. And what that looked like is staggering to my mind. You know, Oftentimes we think about Jesus being on a cross. Now think about uh, the cross that is at Community Baptist Church, you know, up in the baptistry, uh, crosses that are on our steeple. You go out into the graveyard, there's crosses. The cross is everywhere. It, you, people wearing it around their neck as jewelry piece. People have it engraved on their skin through a tattoo uh, as a testimony. I mean, the cross is absolutely everywhere. You know, I've often thought, what what was it that that Jesus, what type of cross was Jesus on? Well, if you think about some of the typical crosses that we see today, by the way, there's a bunch of different designs of crosses. But the typical cross that we see, like at our church, is called the Latin cross. You know, it it, it, it makes, makes a cross. There's a top and there's a bottom and, and sides. But there was also another cross. And now this is not a doctrinal. So if you disagree with me, it's okay. We're still going to be friends. But I don't believe that Jesus was actually crucified on a Latin cross like that we typically see uh, in our church and in other ways. There was actually another cross called the Tav. The Tav was a T and it, it was shaped just like this. And and some people believe that that was the type of cross that it was. And I want to describe why, why I believe it was that way. It doesn't make it me wrong. It doesn't change history or anything like that. What would happen is we often think about the movies when, when the criminal, Jesus or criminal, whoever, whatever we're watching, they were carrying this Latin cross through the streets and they're having to bear their cross. Well, according to Roman history, that really wasn't the case. They would have to bear, but not their, their cross, but not the entire cross. The Tav, which is actually the, the T or the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which means truth, it would be um, a patibulum. It's, it's, a, it's a post and it's a, it's a long post that would stretch from arm to arm. And what it was, they would lay that, that big chunk of wood on the back of those who they just uh, beat. And I can't imagine what that would be like to have the, 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 the scars and the bleeding and, and everything that goes along with this and the nerves exposed. And then you would have this patibulum 
stretched across your back. And then they would tie a rope around both of your arms so this piece of wood would not fall off. Now, it's interesting looking at the weight of this patibulum, this horizontal board, okay? It would be as little as 75 pounds, but it could weigh as much as 150 pounds. Now, some of you have carried that kind of weight. If you are a hunter and you have so much corn that you're taking to your tree stand, some of you have hauled something that was 50 pounds. You know how heavy that is? 100 pounds is super heavy. I can't imagine 150 pounds after being beat. And you're, and you're, you're tied to this patibulum, this horizontal piece of wood, and you're carrying it through the streets. By the way, unclothed. The shame, the, the, the endurance that you would have to have. And so, so as they got to the spot where they were going to crucify them, where they were going to put them on this cross. Now, remember, it wasn't behind the jail. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was often lined on the streets. They wanted to make an example out of these criminals. They would lay the criminal down, the one who's going to, to bear this cross. They would untie him, stretch his arms off, stretch his arms out, and then put the nail in the wrist, not in the hand, because the tissue is so soft that the hand, it would tear through the hand. And so they would let the two bones between the wrist support the weight of the nails. We're not talking about a 16 penny nail. We're talking about a nail. It's a spike that is averaged between five and eight inches long, five and eight inches long. They would drive it through there. Can you imagine the nerves and the pain of just driving the nails, the spikes of something five to seven inches long, a large spike through this hand? They would again get two Roman soldiers on either side and they would lift up the criminal and they would set this heavy beam with this man or woman on this stipe. If you remember from biology class, the mushroom has a stipe. It's simply the vertical part of the stem of the, of the mushroom. The patibulum or the horizontal beam would then rest on this stipe. Now, this stipe was an average of three to 500 pounds, and it continuously stayed in the ground. And the only thing that would change is the patibulum. And I would imagine the weight determined, they would determine what a person could carry by their build or whatever. And so when they would pick the person up on either side, they would lay this, this patibulum on top of this stipe. Now it makes sense. If you are a carpenter or you know anything about carpentry and you think about um, a 200 pound man, and then you take a 150 pound board, and you're trying to connect the two, you would think it would just pull away. And that's why I believe that they laid it on top. Now, some people uh, say that they don't believe that it was a cross at all. They believe it was just one stipe. And the reason some people say this is because in John chapter 12, in the Greek, it uses the word strauss. When he's talking about Jesus was bore his cross, and it uses the word Strauss, meaning um, it means it means a single board. And they and they believe that they took his hands above him and drove them through his wrist here, and his hands were above. I do not believe that is the case, only because what I'm going to tell you next. You remember the board that was engraved above Jesus's head, and it said, "The King of the Jews." Well, the question you have is, did they ju do that just for Jesus? Was that just designed just to humiliate him and him alone? Well, the answer is no. They actually made an inscription, and it's called a titulus, on every single prisoner that was legally found guilty in a court of law or had went through the court of law. We know that Jesus was not found legally guilty. And so what they would do as they were making their march, the inscription would be made, and there would be a rope tied around this. And they would put this around the neck 
of the person. So as they're walking through the street, remember, no clothes, carrying their patibulum around uh, across their back, tied to it with a rope. They're walking down the street. Here is their placard. This is what they did. This is the criminal thing that they're charged for. This is why they're going to the cross. This is why they're going to be crucified. So if you remember, Jesus's was, it said the king of the Jews. That's what he was found guilty of. That's what they said that he was legally tried for, right? Now, once they got, and you read the scriptures in Mark and Matthew and John, once they got Jesus up on the cross and they set him up there, then the placard was put down. Now, people says, well, but where would the placard go? Because he would be hiding the placard. Well, if you look at science, science says that a person's arms and, and ligaments would stretch over six inches once they got up on this cross. That's how much they would bow, bow down. And by the time they got so low, the placard would be up behind them on their patibulum. Now, we're not going to separate as friends if you believe it's a traditional Latin cross. But it is interesting to think that that was a traditional Roman cross. Now, no matter what, it's excruciating. And then they would take the feet and they would cross the feet and drive the nails through the top of the foot. I don't know about you, but just yesterday I was with somebody and they dropped a can on their foot. And I thought, oh, I, how much bad that would have hurt. Can you imagine a spike being drove through both feet? But not only that, to having to push up on that spike and the nerves and, and the tendons and, and everything just screaming out. And then, and then the nails as you're trying to pull yourself up. Can you imagine the pain that they were experiencing? Well, as you know, obviously what was the end result would be as they are slumped down, the diaphragm would then close up. They're not able to breathe and they would try to push themselves up to be able to get their breath. It is amazing that Jesus actually spoke, I believe it was seven times throughout this process that he pushed himself up to speak. What happens is the diaphragm settles, then people begin to suffocate. The heart begins to race and it's trying to produce the oxygen. It's trying to get oxygen. The, the carbon monoxide builds up in the lungs, and then water begins to form around the lungs and around the heart. Many people actually didn't die from suffocation. They actually died from having a heart attack is how they actually died. If you remember the story of Jesus, the Old Testament tells us that there was not a bone to be broken in his body. The two thieves on the cross on either side of him, which we're going to talk about that Sunday morning, and God has given me something that I have never seen before or never heard taught on, but it's, it's a beautiful picture of redemption. The two thieves on either side, their legs were broken because the Passover was coming and they wanted to get them off the cross. By the time they got to Jesus, they realized he was already dead, but they put a spear through his side. If you remember what came out, it was blood and water from the carbon monoxide built up in his lungs and his heart and blood and water poured out. Jesus said, no man's gonna take my life, but I lay it down. And Jesus also had the power to lift it up again. You know, I wanna talk about how is the cross really viewed today? You know, I've thought about this for years and I've thought about knowing the history and what I was taught in college about the crucifixion I've thought about the crosses that are in churches and I thought about what people wear. I thought about would, would people during the Roman time go around wearing crosses around their neck? Would they have them tattooed on their body? Would they, would they hang them on the wall? You know, which apostle was it the apostle John? the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, which one actually wore a cross around his neck as a symbol? And the answer is none of them because it was ludicrous to think about why would you do that? As you ponder the devices that are used today, 
what is used today to kill somebody, to act upon capital punishment? Well, you have the noose that is used still in some states, I imagine not very often, but electric chair, the lethal injection, the gas chamber, even firing squad. All over the world, there's different forms of capital punishment used. Now, the cross was equivalent to the noose, the electric chair, the lethal injection, the gas chamber, the firing squad. Can you imagine you walk into your jeweler and say, I need you to make me something. I really want something that's very important to me. And they would, of course, ask what that was and say, I want a gold pendant of an electric chair. And I want to be able to show people my electric chair and just how much it means to me. I've often thought, you know, why the cross? You know, what was the purpose in the cross? You know, what? why did God do that? Why did he choose that? That's what he chose, to glorify himself. And through the death of Jesus Christ, God was glorified. But can you imagine walking into a jeweler and saying that? Can you imagine the looks that you would get of saying, people saying, electric chair? Well, actually, I'm going to be honest. You walk into and you say, I, I just really want a tattoo. I just really want to show my testimony. And my testimony, would you put this firing squad across my back just to show the testimony of my faith? People would think, that's crazy. That would be exactly how people in the New Testament age and before would say, you put a cross around your neck? Why in the world would you would you do that? Why in the world would you have that around your neck? That makes no sense. That's the type of excruciating. They understood what it, what it meant. Now, if somebody did this, you would think they would be crazy, dark, maybe even demonic. And I would have to agree if you grew up in that era and you saw those things and how horrific a, a crucifixion was. You know, in, in my studies, I've thought, why is it that the cross is glorified like it is as a symbol? You know, the Roman Catholic Church in their creed actually put out, they said, we are going to glorify the cross. And not only that, we're going to wave it like a, a, like a flag. As a state would represent its flag, we're going to wave the cross like a flag. You know, in the Jew's mind, it probably made no sense. Why in the world would they do this? The question I have, so is it wrong to celebrate the cross, to have a pendant with the cross, to have you look around your walls and you have a picture of the cross? Why do you have a cross? Why do you have a, a gold necklace with a cross on it? What does it represent to you? Why do we have crosses in the church? Why do we why do we have this representation of such a cruel, cruel death? You know, a long time ago, even before the Persians, people uh, um, had crosses on their clothing. In fact, it has been proven that ancient Egyptians in their carvings actually on um, on the carvings actually had crosses on their on their clothing that was was carved into some of the carvings that archaeologists have found not only that they have found carvings where people have had uh, uh necklaces with crosses on it not the latin cross but nevertheless it was the cross and so in studying this you're thinking why is it that even the early egyptians would have crosses because were they celebrating the cross of Christ? Were they celebrating the crucifixion? Were they looking ahead for what was going to happen? And the answer is no. In fact, the cross has been used for a long time. In fact, even false gods were, were worshipped. It was the sun god who used the cross. They used the cross to worship the sun god. And so the early Egyptians even, even discovered, and um, if it was obviously satanic, but it was they were already using the cross and adorning themselves, but it was to their pagan sun god. You think about some of the songs that are sung today. You think about some of the songs about the cro cry, uh, cross. And you think the popularity of the songs sung about the Christ, the cross. 
there's some songs that I think, wow, we're, we're really on the edge of idolatry. We're really on the edge of focusing on a tangible thing, you know, and it's easy. It's easy to worship something tangible. It's easy because there's people that have these crosses and they're rubbing them all day and just protect me or I'm going to put up this cross to protect me from the evil spirits or I'm going to have the rosary beads and I'm going to count them and I'm going to do this. There's people that have the crucifix that Jesus is still on. Well, there's no doubt that that is not scriptural. And the reason that uh, certain religions leave Jesus Christ on the cross because they believe that every time they sin, they re-crucify Christ. Now, if you know your Old Testament and your New Testament, the Bible says that the blood of bull and goats only covered the sin. But in Hebrews, Jesus Christ took it away. He no longer covered it. So either Jesus Christ is still on that cross or he is not. And it was a once and for all sacrifice. So we know the crucifix of Jesus being on the cross is definitely wrong. But back to my illustration of people want something tangible. They want something as a reminder, you know, how far some people go in adorning the cross, celebrating the cross, holding to the cross, even worshiping the cross. Well, you have to be careful because there are some things that God intended for good and man has turned around for evil, have they not? Let me give you an illustration of this. Knowing your scriptures in John chapter three, verse 16, do you remember what it says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But do you know the first three verses before that? Oftentimes people do not have a clue about what the, the three, two, or three verses before that talks about. The two or three verses before that actually talks about a story that happened in Numbers chapter 21. The children of Israel had been disobedient. And because of their disobedience, God was punishing them. In fact, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 6, the Bible says the Lord sent a fiery serpent among the people and they bit the people. Many people died in Israel. And I don't know how many people died in Israel. Interesting study, but enough where they came to Moses and they said, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and we have spoken against you. You see, God sent the fiery serpent to bite the people and to kill the people. And I don't know how long it took, but I think it shows a hardness of heart until the point where they, they bowed the knee and they said, we have sinned against you and we wanna turn our back on this sin. They said this, Moses, will you do something for us? We need you to intercede to the Lord for us. We want him to remove these serpents. And if you remember what Moses did, he said, I'll do that. He interceded for them. And then he, and this is what God said. He said, I want you to make a fiery serpent and I want you to set it on a pole. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten by a serpent, if they will just turn and look at this serpent, he will live. And so Moses did it. He made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole and everybody who was bit, they looked upon the serpent and they lived. In fact, if you go back to John chapter three, verses 14 and 15, it talks about Jesus being lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole. And people, and it's talking about, if you look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, guess what? You will live. You will live eternally with him. That's the comparison here. Now, it was a good thing, right? The serpent was a good thing. Having this uh, bronze serpent, the people lived. God answered their prayer. They repented. They turned their back on their sin. All of this was a good thing. Well, often we don't know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. But you have to go to 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 and 4 to get the rest of the story. Everything about the serpent was good. The way God did it what God did with it, the people's lives that were saved. But then later on, the people did something with that serpent. 
In 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, He did right in the sight of the Lord, talking about Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah was there to help the people, and he began to get rid of some of this idolatry that was going on in the land. And he said, according to all that his father David had done, he removed the high places and broken down the sacred pillars. And then it says, he also broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the son of Israel burned incense into it. Now, what happened? They had a serpent that God told Moses to make. He set it on a pole. The people looked and they lived. Later on, another generation, they have this bronze serpent and they begin to burn incense towards it. You know what they begin to do? They begin to worship the bronze serpent to the point where Hezekiah had to come in and destroy the serpent. You know what it proves? People needed something tangible. You know what? I can even see them making excuses. This is a good thing. This is ordained by God. God did this. God told Moses to make it. Speaking of that, if you know me, you know that what I have said about the, the burial of Moses. Nobody knows where Moses is buried. In fact, there is a discussion between Michael the archangel and Satan himself in Jude chapter 9, where Satan questions Michael concerning the burial of Moses. And Michael doesn't even try to discuss this with him. He says, see Jesus. Now, why is it that God did not expose the burial of Moses? Could you imagine what took place today? Could you imagine the multi-million dollar building that people, the, the children of Israel, the Jews would had made a shrine? They knew where the body of Moses was. Can you imagine the amount of money that people would spend coming in there to worship Moses? And you know what they would say? But it was a good thing. God used him. It was God's man. We need to do this. It would turn into idolatry. That's exactly what happened here with this brazen serpent that, that God told Moses to lift up. Eventually, the people turned it into idolatry. So what does Christ tell us to do about the cross? That was all introduction. Now, I've only got about five minutes left, so don't worry. But what, is, what does he tell us to do with the cross? Does he tell us to worship the cross? Does he tell us to hang it around our neck? By the way, nothing wrong with that. Some people, that's a reminder. Some people, this, this, is, this is Jesus Christ is not here. He is risen. Nothing wrong with that. Don't take this out of context at all. But what does he want us to do with the cross? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 tells us, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, they must do this, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? Does it mean to hang in, hang that cross on the wall? By the way, some people uh, mistaken what it means to take up your cross, do they not? What does it mean to take up your cross? For some people, they would say, you know what? This coronavirus has hit. My husband's lost her job. I'm part time. We're going through a financial uh, struggle right now you know what? It's our cross to bear. That's what's going on right now. It's just our cross. Some people would say, I lost my job. That's my cross to bear. Some people would say, you know, I just come from the doctor and I've got this terrible disease. That's the cross. That's my cross to bear. Some people would say, you know what? My husband, he's an alcoholic. I shouldn't have married him. I did marry him. He was a good guy when we got married. You know what? It's just my cross to bear. You know what? When sin entered into the world, all of civilization was changed. And the scripture is clear that if you live on this earth, you're going to have problems. You're going to have trouble times. That's the truth. It doesn't make it your cross to bear. That's not what he's talking about. Besides that, do unbelievers lose their job? Do they have financial pressures? Do they have rocky marriages? The answer is yes. Would you look at them and say, that's just the cross Christ has you bearing? No, you wouldn't dare tell them that. So what does it mean? when Jesus says to take up your cross and follow after him. Well, the first thing, there's two things really in the, in the past, in the scriptures that I see. It doesn't mean the necessarily worship it. It doesn't say adorn it. It doesn't say that we're focused on the cross. 
It doesn't mean to turn it into an idolatry thing, to turn it into a tangible thing. What he means is this. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, the first thing is death to self. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, but alive to God in, in Christ Jesus. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it wasn't walking down the aisle and saying a prayer. And then you get up and go live your own life. Jesus Christ says there must be a death to self. I think about all the places that we've ministered to, the streets we've been on, New York and Honduras and Mexico and Trinidad, Tobago and Cuba. Wow. You know, the hardest street that I've ever ministered on was the streets of Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm still yet to lead somebody to Christ in all the times of going soul winning on the streets of Greensboro. I've never led one person to Christ. The easiest was New York. We led the most people to Christ in New York. I don't know why I've thought about it a bunch. Is it because we're in the Bible belt? Is it because people are hard hearted? I have no idea, but you know what we tell them? We don't tell them, say this prayer. We don't tell them, go get baptized. All those things I think is okay, but we tell them Christianity is a death to yourself and to live for Jesus Christ that you're no longer living for yourself. Galatians 2, 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, I who lives, but it is Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I have to live it by faith. What? In the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Matthew 16, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose, lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, then they're going to find it. Death to self has to be number one, when you become a Christian. Now, how often does this happen? There is something that's taking place uh, right now, and some of you uh, may be practicing it yourself, but I want to discourage you from it. It's the practice of Lent. What is Lent? Lent is uh, a Roman Catholic practice that is 40 days before Easter, and you decide to have penance or you fast, and so I've heard people say, hey, what are you doing for Lent? Oh, I'm, I'm going to cut my hair. Or what are you doing for Lent? Well, I'm going to give up sodas. What are you doing for Lent? Well, I'm, I'm going to stay away from this person. I'm going to give up my cell phone. All kinds of crazy things when they talk about Lent and practicing Lent for 40 days. You know, the scripture is very clear. It doesn't say to give up something for 40 days. Paul says this, that I have to die to myself every single day. I don't know about you, but that is a practice I have to do. If I was 13 or if I'm 99, every day we have to practice death to self because we're still in this old flesh. If we only had to die to ourselves for 40 days, have to give up something for 40 days, then, you know, sign me up. But that's not what Christianity really is. First of all, it's a death to self. But the second thing, it could be the ultimate sacrifice. It's death to your life. Now, we are very blessed in this country. The persecution in this country is here, but I believe we're going to see it very strong, even in my lifetime, unless the rapture takes place. We know we will see it during the tribulation, and we won't, but those who are left will. But all over the world, people are being crucified because and killed and beheaded because they're Christians. And Christ said, it will be this way. Listen to Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he's got to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And then it says this, and be killed, but he'll be raised up on the third day. He made this very clear. And if you remember Peter's conversation right after that, oh, no, no, you can't do that. But he said, I'm going to be killed. Now, but if you go back to Matthew chapter uh, 10, he said, a disciple is not above his master, nor a slave above his master. Verse 25, it is enough for the disciple to become like his teacher, a slave like his master. He says, if they call me the, the master of this house, Beelzebub, then obviously you're one of his demons. You're one of his followers. He says, if they treat me the master of the house, I promise you, they're going to treat you the very same way. 
Now, it's very possible that you and I may not lose our life for the gospel, our physical life, but there is no doubt that he is calling us to die to ourselves on a daily basis. And I know me, and I know that that is a constant dying to self and the desires that Chris has over what Jesus Christ has for me. Now, as you look at this and you think about what are we really worshiping? Today's Wednesday. What's the importance about Wednesday? Wednesday, Jesus preaches his last message. You know what he tells them? Be careful. Be careful in his message when he's preaching to the disciples, preaching against the Pharisees, preaching against the legalism, preaching against the traditionalism. He says, be careful. Watch the cults. Watch people trying to influence you to make it sound good, but it's not the best. Be careful. But in two days, we're going to reflect upon his death. But Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Father, we love you. Thank you for the cross. God, don't let us become so consumed with the wood. But God, your justification, your death, the sacrifice that you did on that cross. God, let us worship that. Let us reflect upon that. God, thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not forget, 7 a.m. Sunday morning. If it's not raining, I'll be out by the crosses at the church. And then 1030 with Pastor Gossett, and there will be a full service there on Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Have a good night.